and she asked me to go over neurosepsis, but I'm not going to go into the strict details of sepsis of an adult or a pediatric until we get into ER. Okay? So when we get to those topics, I know you guys may have a lot of questions. Just know that I am not going to ask you a question on this test that is in details that are not included on the PowerPoints, okay? So even if you go into and read about sepsis, because that is one of the possible differentials of your FUO, just know that if I didn't talk about it or put it on your slides, it's not going to be on this test. It may be on the next for ER, of course. Okay? All right. Just wanted to have that disclaimer before we get started. <clears throat> so, fever of unknown origin. Again, this one we're talking specifically strictly with adults. Um, upon this uh, lecture, you're going to be able to define what constitutes an adult fever of unknown origin and then how to go about the diagnoses, list the probable differentials of the etiologies of that FUO, determine obviously in the presentation your HMP findings and then uh, the treatment that's appropriate for um, that definitive diagnosis. So, fever of unknown origin by definition. Document a documented fever, that doesn't mean I think I've had a fever. A documented fever for at least three weeks of greater than 100.94 Fahrenheit, which is 38.3 Celsius. And then of an undetermined, unknown etiology, meaning they've been hospitalized and we've been investigating and working this up for a week. Then the specific diagnosis on your ICD-10 codes will be FUL, yes. Is this like a constant fever or is it like relaxing? So it can be intermittent, obviously. It's not a continuous un... Um, inhibited, it's just persistent. It keeps coming back, regardless if they take a, a pyogenic, or pyuretic, sorry, no, pyogenic, pyuretic, um, Tylenol, Motrin, ibuprofen, any of those, okay? So it just means that it hasn't been gone for a long period of time. Um, all right, so ideologies. Number one etiology we're going to think of, obviously, is infection. Uh, and then you're going to go into neoplasms that can cause uh, infections and fever. Um, then you've got collagen vascular diseases, which is something that a lot of us don't think about when we're thinking of fever. Uh, miscellaneous, so certain medications, whether it's a prescribed medication or an illicit drug use cause fevers, especially all of your stimulants that are obviously are increasing your heart rate and cause an increase in your temperature, and vice versa. An infection causes an increased body temperature, which causes an increased heart rate. So again, it's one of those chicken before the egg and before the chicken thing. Which one's cause what? And then you're undiagnosed again. You can have an FUO that you're treating in the hospital, and you've put them on antibiotics, and they've responded, improved, the fever was eradicated, and you never knew what the etiology was. That's going to happen. We don't always have the answers. It doesn't mean you have to know the answers either. The problem arises is if it continues to occur. And then again, you just continue to work it up. If you've eliminated all the possibilities that are the most probable etiology, then again, you've got fever of unknown origin. And that's one of those things that in medicine that we just cringe upon because we want to know. So do your patients, and they're not going to be satisfied with that. But you explain to them all the things, and they're going to know all the tests that you're doing on them. It's not just willy-nilly. All right. So now we're going to go specifically into the infectious causes. These are not listed in any specific order as far as most common, most probable. It's just these things cause uh, an infectious cause of a fever. So you've got infected endocarditis, obviously. Any intra-abdominal infection. And we're not just specifically talking bacterial. It can be bacterial, viral, fungal, in any of these infections, okay? So infection doesn't always mean bacterial, and I'm sure you guys by now know all that. But make sure that you're not forgetting of the other possibilities. We just went over fungal. 
with my last lecture, so <clears throat> just keep those in mind. Osteomyelitis, infection that's actually gotten into the bone. The bone is where your bone marrow arises, so obviously you become septic uh, at times with that, especially if it's been a chronic thing. Peripheral blood vessels, so you've got vasculitis, those types of things that can cause uh, fevers. Tuberculosis obviously would be the one that's going to be high on your differential to make sure you rule that out. They don't always have to have a cough. They don't always have to have the night sweats or the hemoptysis. Make sure you've got that in your differential and you're ruling it out. Do you guys know what the lab diagnostic test would be to rule that out? So it depends on what specimen. So if you're going to do an acid fast bacilli test, what are you going to use? So if you're going to do blood, what's it going to be in the form of? What's your order going to be? If you're going to look for acid fast bacilli in the blood, you're going to order a blood culture and sensitivity. Okay. These are the things that you need to be thinking. If it's in the lungs, what are you going to be ordering? Sputum culture and sensitivity. What's, who said it? Somebody said it. Chest x-ray. And again, those aren't definite, but those are things you're going to be ordering to roll these things out. What's the other screening test that you guys all have to have before you go out on rotations to roll out TB? The arm thing? PPD, TB, tuberculin skin test? Okay, so all of those things you're going to be thinking of. Okay, trying to figure out the etiology. How do I find the etiology? What do I do? What do I order? But those are the things that you're going to be ordering for TB. Kidney infections. So a kidney infection indicating uh, a fever, meaning the infection is in the kidney organ itself, is causing a high fever. What is the medical term for that? Pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis. Good. I'm going to try and integrate a little bit of um, application because you guys should be into this by now. Right. So, kidney infection, pyelonephritis. UTI is also known as urinary tract infection, but what is the medical term for that? Cystitis. And then urosepsis, which again, that's just a urinary tract infection, whether it is pre-renal, renal, or post-renal. Um, and then you've got the criteria that means sepsis, which is what you're going to get in ER. Okay. All right. So now we've got neoplastic causes. You cannot um, completely forget about cancers causing infection, causing fever. Um, so even though you've got your infection going on because your CBC showed an elevation of your white blood cell count and your differential showed that it was bacterial and your chest x-ray showed that you've got a pneumonia, you still, if you've got a big mass looking thing on your chest x-ray as well as the pneumonia, you can't rule out that there's a neoplasm there. So you've got, sometimes you can get a cancer within the lungs that is in the perihilar area, which is around the bronchial tubes, that is blocking that airway from being utilized appropriately and you get an infection secondary to the tumor. Do you guys know what the term of that would be? So you've got a um, just trying to help you out, but I think I'm just going to end up giving you the answer. Um, a lot of the times you'll have a complete lobe that's whited out or a wedged shape because it's an obstructive pneumonia, meaning it's obstructed by the cancer that's there. Okay. All this is going to start tying together. And when you do your chest x-ray and you're like, okay, I know she's got an elevated white now. She looks like, acts like, and is appropriately reacting to my antibiotics for pneumonia. Yes, she has pneumonia, but she's got a pneumonia secondary to the neoplasm. And it's obstructed this completely. 
those are the things that you should be able to, as you become a seasoned practitioner, going, I've got a widened out, wedged, complete low crap. Do we have a, a cancer that's causing that? Okay. All right, so solid tumors. Sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, these can be either the kidneys uh, or the liver hep hepatoma. I mean, obviously the ones that I've already talked about. Um, lymphoreticular, so the reticular system, the production of your blood, and the lymphatics, so you've got your Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So not only is your white blood cell count going to be elevated, but you're also going to have a fever. So you can't just jump on the bandwagon and think, well, they just got a really bad infection. We've got to make sure. And your white count, you guys had neoplasms as far as the labs that would go with that? and what to expect. So it's not just going to be a slightly elevated white count or a white count that's above 20 to 30,000 because that meets criteria for admission. We're talking 60, 70, 80,000. That's when you're like, oh, this is not just an infection. We've got to make sure we don't have some type of blood cancer. Then you've got to determine, is that leukemia or lymphoma? So what's the um, blood supply or what's the um, ideology behind that? All right. As we go from each slide to the next, these are less and less common, but again, you cannot just forget about them. Biggest thing in your differential, if you don't think about it, you're not going to order the tests to rule it out. And then you're going to, again, have that fever and unknown, unknown origin. You're going to consult with specialists. You're going to consult, obviously, with infectious disease. But these are the things that they're going to think of, too. They're going to help you think of the more difficult things to diagnose the possibilities that are there. Okay? Because you may not think of all these. And I can guarantee you, even in ER, I have not really ever thought of every one of these. I didn't know that rheumatoid arthritis was. Uh, I do know it can cause a fever when it's acutely active because it's red, hot, swollen, infected joint. But still, um, you just don't think of that off the top of your head when you've got somebody in with a fever. It's not the first off of the top of my list. All right. So, Steele's disease. Do you guys know the presentation and what all that uh, involves? It's one that's more rare and one that we're not as familiar with. Um, read up on it, but it's not one that you're going to encounter as much. We get a little bit more um, of that, but it, it goes a lot of your symptoms are similar to the myalgias and arthralgias and obviously fever. Temporal arteritis, also known as giant cell arteritis, um, polymyalgia rheumatica is different. It's not the same thing as GCA, it's just for some reason putting on the same line. <laughs> um, but again, that's not going to be the top of my differential, but if your patient is complaining about headaches and loss of vision, as well as being worse unilaterally, one on one side than the other, then we better make sure that we rule that out. What's the defini definitive diagnosis? How do you rule the GCA out? I have the temporal artery. <clears throat> what blood work would you be looking for? Yes, I. Giant cells on a per, on a what? On a biopsy. Right. Okay. You're right. So, what about as far as just lab work? Would you be looking for? CRP. C-reactive protein. Now, are those definite answer lab tests? No. What do we call those? Inflammatory. Inflammatory markers, which means. It's going to help us to know if, yes, this is, we're on the right path. If it's negative, then we're taking a different road. That's the only thing that's helping us out. And C-reactive protein is a good marker to kind of follow as far as progression or regression of the inflammation or infection. Because that's both. All right. Vasculitis syndrome. <laughs> so you've got polyarteritis nodosa, which we found in one of our humanities lessons that is um, rare and difficult to diagnose. Just don't uh, forget about it. And then when you're spraying along the can cause a fever as well. 
<laughs> so those that we just were talking about, C-reactive protein and the sed rate are going to be elevated with inflammation and infection. But also you've got your, your rheumatoid disorders that are going to cause the same thing. Cystic lupus erythematosus and then your rheumatoid arthritis. And that is, again, when they're having exacerbations or flare-ups of those disorders. Because if it's autoimmune and it's your body attacking itself, it's inevitably going to cause your white count to go up and your... Um, finger to uh, occur. Fictitious fever. Again, very, very rare. I myself cannot think of one case where I have come across my own child since yet. I've seen it a lot on TV, <laughs> and I know it exists, but I have not seen it myself. I know I've had uh, co-workers that have. So it does exist, it's just not as common. So make sure, again, um, whether it's a child or an adult, they may or may not give you the answers by the history. So that's when it starts getting complicated. And if they're in the hospital and everything's not really adding up and looking according to what you're expecting, make sure that you are disrobing that patient with a chaperone and looking at every possibility. All right, so um, drug fever, again, antibiotics. <clears throat> the reason that's listed is not that, oh, antibiotics are not one of those things that we think causes a fever. It's just the fact that it's messing up our tests and we can't figure out the answers because the patient had leftover antibiotics at their, in their cabinet, whether it was theirs or their child or their husband's, and they started taking them. And so, of course, all of our cultures are going to be negative. Uh, regardless if that's sputum or blood or CSF, it's messing up our tests. So we can't figure out the origin. That doesn't mean it's not existing, and you still treat it empirically of what the most probable cause would be, uh, trying to get them to improve, but you may not ever figure it out, especially if the patient's not a very good historian or if they're taking medications, again, on the sides. A lot of the times they'll tell you. Well, I thought that this would help. I had this leftover it helped last time, but I only had a couple of days, and I forgot to tell you because that was two weeks ago. Okay, so make sure you think of that so that you can specifically ask them, because again, your patient's not going to think about that. They're not going to know it's messed up everything. Sometimes it's just a conundrum, and you're thinking, God, I'm scratching my head. I've done everything. I'm trying to figure this out, and it's just not giving me an answer. Why? And then you ask, Have you been on any antibiotics recently, regardless if they've been prescribed to you or not, you're not going to get in trouble just helping me know to figure out how to take care of you the best. And they'll go, oh, yeah. I should have asked that three days ago. <laughs> All right. Barbiturates. So any of your medications that patients take to help them sleep. Um, if they're taking uh, it more than what it's supposed to be as far as prescribed can cause a fever. Antiarrhythmics. Obviously, it's messing with the rhythm of your heart, and again, um, that's affecting your temperature. Phenytoin, which is um, the generic, Stylantin being the brand name, that medication is very well known for causing fevers. So, um, if they're on that medication, again, you're not just going to say, okay, aha, that's the answer, but make sure you're ruling the other things out, and if nothing else is making sense, then that's could be your positive agent. Just don't forget that that could cause your fever. Sarcoidosis goes along with the others with systemic uh, lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis, so it's another rheumatologic uh, autoimmune disorder of the lungs. What um, ethnic background has a higher risk of sarcoidosis? African American. African Americans. Good. You guys remember and you know this. Uh, does that surprise you? <laughs> Sometimes our brain kicks out the answers and we're like trying to Google because we don't believe ourselves. I still do that. Still. All right. And then irritable bowel disease. So obviously your GI tract is going to cause some problems. Also. Um, 
even if you are hypovolemic because you've got irritable bowel, you're vomiting a lot and diarrhea a lot or constipation, which causes a severe constipation can cause a UTI because it also not only backs up your bowel, but backs up the bladder flow. So think of those things as well. All right. So most importantly, again, is your history. Travel is going to be an extremely important question to ask. When you cannot figure out the ideology, don't forget about travel. Have you been traveling anywhere for any length of time? Out of the country, in the country, it doesn't matter because sometimes people think, well, I'm just going to ask if you traveled out of the country. Well, we just found out the other day, Arizona, Kentucky, I went and toured the chicken farm, you know, those kinds of things. Have you traveled recently? Where did you go? What type of activities did you do? Did you go and uh, explore the caves? Okay. Occupation. What is their occupation? Do they work in the mines? Do they work in the caves? Do they work as a farmer, as a chicken farmer? <clears throat> Hobbies, again. We've got tons of hunters in this area, and they are going to travel, um, and they're going to go seek out those animals. So you've got to find out uh, what's going on. Exposure to animals, I guess that's the very next one. And then known infectious contacts. So um, especially during the, the heightened season of, of flu and strep, we always remember, well, have you been exposed to anybody with flu recently? But we tend not to ask those questions when it's not something that we commonly encounter. So just don't forget about that possibility. Have you been around anybody recently that's been ill? And they may or may not know what the cause of their illness was. But, oh yeah, I, I visited my cousin three days ago and she wasn't feeling very well. These were her symptoms. Um, and then you communicate, you can consult with that uh, physician, that provider of that person, if it is in conjunction with you taking care of the patient. Now, it has to be something significant enough, like meningitis would be important to share. Um, if it was something not, you know, significant, then yes, that might be kind of gray area of HIPAA. It just depends on how sick your patient is. If your patient is immunocompromised and in a normal patient, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But again, whoever you call and talk to to consult about that other patient, let them know the status of your patient and why it's more probable that this could be more significant and we need to know so that we can treat them appropriately, quickly, and not have any bad outcomes. All right. Drug use, we've already talked about that. And then family history. So family history, that's why we ask. Have you lived with anybody with tuberculosis or been treated with tuberculosis? Have you lived with anybody um, or lived in confined spaces, um, homeless people, or been in a um, situation where they were evacuated and you had multiple people in your home because they came from an area uh, that had a hurricane or a tornado or whatever, and what type of infectious stuff were they exposed to? Surgical history. So obviously if you had a patient that had a fever and you didn't really disrobe them or look for surgical scars very well, they could have just recently had an, an, uh, a surgery and now they've got an infected operative site. That would be something simple that they don't think of, again, as a patient, um, but is a very high probability uh, have you had any recent surgeries. <clears throat> That's the other reason why we ask that. Very important. All right. So confirmation of the fever, obviously, that's why we take temperatures. We document that. Um, the temperature again has to be greater than 100.39. Right? Nine four. Oh, nine four. I, I obviously am just left it. <laughs> I've realized that just recently, in the past couple of years, really, really bad. All right, um, so assessing the pattern of fever, is it just at night? Why is it that when we are having a fever, sometimes it's just at night, or it's most likely going to spike at night? When you have patients that you hospitalize, you follow them, you look at their vitals, 
and having their vitals done Q shift, which is Q8 to 12 hours, depending on their protocol. And it usually spikes at night when they are paper off. Why is that? Is that when you're in temperature that is lower to help you sleep? Your temperature is usually higher at night. When they're going to spike a fever, if they're still sick, it's almost mm -hmm. always going to be in the middle of the night. And that's when you're going to see your febrile seizures in the middle of the night, because that's when their temperatures are going to spike. Um, they've done tons of studies, and they still have not figured out a definitive evidence-based medicine answer to that. Some say it might have to do with a cortisone spike, kind of like the cardiac events, because that increases your heart rate. Um, and again, we've found that increasing the heart rate and those different hormones can sometimes cause fevers. So, but there's not been anything to prove or disprove why. We just know that it always happens. <clears throat> so, complete physical exam. Make sure the skin, you're looking for rashes as well as disruptions, wounds, scratches, anything like that. You're doing the lymph nodes that go along with that because that's going to help you lead to where the source of infection is. Um, I had a, I was a phlebotomist at my undergraduate paper, um, my living expenses, and I was a sophomore and was on morning draw. And of course, we're drawing 50 to 70 patients per like four or five phlebotomists, so that's several blood draws at one point. And um, as I was walking, I felt like there was an ache or a pain, and I stuck my hand down, kind of, what's that? And there was literally like a knot, probably the size of a golf ball, but I exaggerated it and thought, oh crap, I have cancer. Because I've never felt that before, and it was sore, so I went down to the ER. And the first thing that he did, um, after asking me, obviously, being hype a college student, all of my PID and all that kind of possibilities, that was all ruled out. Um, he still had me just roll from the waist down and I'm like, I haven't answered no to anything. Didn't do a pelvic exam, but he was checking the lymphatics not only here and in my abdomen, but we found a tick that of course I didn't see there. And I ended up with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and they treated me by doing the tests and the screening and I hadn't even, um, I had started running a fever uh, within 12 hours of that visit, but as of that visit, I hadn't been running a fever. So lymph enlargement can definitely give you a trigger of where. And because of it being there, he wanted to thoroughly check what's going on. You know, creepy, 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 creepy critters. I um, did uh, archery shoots myself. So was in the woods a lot. You probably had that too for a couple of days before that occurred. All right. Um, so, lymph nodes, skin, very important. Eyes, uh, again, not really going to see a whole lot with that, but sometimes if you've got a very, very bad uh, conjunctivitis, that can also cause some fever. Uh, abdomen is going to be very, very common, so make sure you do a good thorough abdominal exam. You've got tons of organs and a lot of things that could be infected in there. A lot of things that can go wrong. So your panels of checking how those organs are functioning. <clears throat> so not only is your white blood cell count going to be elevated, um, what blood values would you be looking at for a pancreatitis? Oh, okay. Lipase, lipase, lipase. MLA, lipase are your pancreatic enzymes. ALP is what organ? Liver. So then what else goes along with that? AST and ALT. What about your kidneys? GFR. 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 creatinine. And GFR. So those are all going to be elevated if you've got an infection with those. So those are your organ systems that you're going to be looking at as far as lab medicine goes. All right, we've already talked about chest and pulmonary. Just make sure that when you're looking at that chest x-ray, you're trying to figure out, you know, do we just have something going on here? What if you don't have a pneumonia or a chest x-ray that looks like pneumonia, but you've got a chest x-ray that's got pleural effusions? What could that be? 
than in the game. So instead of your chest x-ray showing a loculation or an infiltrate being a pneumonia, or a completely widened out area being an obstructed pneumonia from a cancer, but you've got pleural effusion, which is what? Good on your lungs. CHF would be a possibility. The CHF cause infection? Sometimes it can. If that's, you know, bacteria love moisture, right? You got moist lungs. That's been going on because they're in congestive heart failure mildly, running along two to three weeks. So again, possibility. But the other thing that you've got to think of, if they've got a pleural effusion that they said they went to the doctor two days ago and they did a chest x-ray and it was completely clear and now today, two days later, you're checking the chest x-ray and they've got 50% of the lung fields bilaterally full. What does that indicate? So, pleural effusions that come on quickly is significant, usually an indication of some type of organ failure or cancer somewhere. Doesn't always mean in the lungs. Okay. So, if you had kidney failure, liver failure, heart failure, Respiratory failure, obviously, is going to present some, they're going to be in, intubated in an ICU before you figure that out, right? So, those are the things that you would think of. But bacteria loves moisture, so even if they've had a low level of CHF for quite a while, that may be the underlying etiology of their infection. The pneumonia just hasn't shown up yet. Okay? When you guys learned about pulmonology and your chest x-ray, does your white count go up first, or does the pneumonia show up on chest x-ray first? Your white count is going to be elevated first. Your chest x-ray infiltrates lag two days behind your white count. Granted that you've got somebody that can boost an immune response. So somebody that's not immune compromised. I'm slowly introducing some of the ER stuff so that you're not thrown at it all at once. Dr. Lovelace is an amazing lecturer, but he goes extremely fast and gives you tons of information that you need to know. And so I'm kind of just spilling a little bit here and there to give you some intro again, so that it won't be the first time that you've heard it. All right. So the infiltrates, moisture, bacteria loves moisture, just think they've been walking around with that fluid in their for quite a while. If it's quick and then abrupt, then you've got failure of something going on and something bad. Um, so you need to be more aggressive with consulting with infectious disease and your pulmonologist or whatever organ it is that is looking like it's causing the, the failure. Heart, so we've already discussed a little bit of congestive heart failure there. Endocarditis. So it doesn't matter how old they are, do not rule out infective endocarditis. If they've got in a fever, uh, and they may not know to tell you the other sequela that they had three or four days ago or even last week that they got better. What's the number one cause? <laughs> Diabetes and stress. Okay. So I had a 17-year-old come into the urgent care. His chief complaint was chest discomfort. He admitted to shortness of breath when he was being active uh, in his sports, so he's been kind of uh, not doing sports for the past few days, and he's been fatigued. Didn't tell me anything else. Asked him about fever, sore throat, all that. No, 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 no. Went through my physical exam, stuck my stethoscope on his heart, bam, huge, raging murmur. Have you ever had a heart murmur before? No, what's that? You've got a problem. You've got a 17-year-old, healthy, no past medical history of any problems, doesn't even know what a murmur is, so we know nobody's ever told him that. So then my next question was, within the past two weeks, have you had a fever or a sore throat? Yes. 
Were you treated with it? Did you go to the doctor? No, I was home for three days. Took time on and went back to school. Sent him to the ER. He had an echocardiogram and was flown to Wichita and was in surgery within 12 hours, having a valve replacement. Mm -hmm. That's how significant it was. So, infective endocarditis was the reason for his murmur. And he was not febrile when he came into my office. He was a lucky, lucky, lucky kid. A lot of the times when you've got college age kids or adolescents, doesn't mean that you absolutely have to have them go to the doctor every time they have a sore throat, but I encourage it. You're never going to go wrong. That one that you miss is not a good feeling. Um, meningitis is the other thing. Could be that, and that can be pretty significant as well. So <clears throat> that would be under neuro would be the meningitis. Okay, so it's still in here, but you've got to think of all the possibilities. Musculoskeletal, one of the things that come to mind for fever. Septic joint. Septic joint. What'd you say? Osteosarcoma. Osteosarcoma. It's a neoplasm of the bone. Yes. Anybody else? Osteomyelitis. We're going to go over in detail here shortly. <clears throat> so, um, can a fracture? Or multiple fractures cause fever? Yes. Systemic or locally? Systemic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Most of the time it's locally unless there's multiple. Um, then you're going to have systemic symptoms. Especially if it's a big bone, femur, pelvic fracture. Okay? Because again, and that's what produces your, your blood. What are the bones that produce most of your blood? Where is erythropoiesis? Where? Bone marrow, but what bones? Femur. Long bones. Femur. Long bones. So your femur. What do you think? Humerus. Humerus. Not as much as your pelvis. And your spine. So in order, it would be femur, pelvis, spine then humerus and clavicle for some reason. I guess because of the length. You would think tip did would be more. Yes. <clears throat> Oral cavity, obviously, uh, they've had some dental pain, um, abscess of the upper um, jaw teeth, very close to the sinuses, which is very close to the meninges of the brain. One of the presidents, I think it was, which president died from a tooth abscess? They had wooden teeth, was it? Washington. Was it? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Maybe they all had wooden teeth back then. I should know somebody did. I was stuck in those trees. Okay. All right, and then neuro again. Number one would be meningitis that you do not want to miss. Uh, Anything rheumatologic that's going to cause your neuro uh, symptoms as well. Labs, we've already gone over a lot of these. So CBC, the things that you're looking for in your differential is going to be left shift. That's exactly what I was wanting to hear. Perfect. Somebody read. Left shift meaning. Lymphocytes or neutrophils are higher. Okay. Neutrophils. Good answer. What's ESR stand for? Erythrocyte sedimentation rate. CRP? C reactive purpose. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what is ESR? So, say that again. It's not like the time that it takes the like red blood cells to settle after they've been spun. Mm -hmm. And what's a reticulocyte? A baby red blood cell. Okay, right. So they spin it and then it settles and that's the rate at which that settles. Um, but obviously when you're churning and having inflammation and infection, 
your body is producing more blood cells so that they can differentiate whether they go into red blood cells or lymphocytes to fight the infection, which can be leukocytes to fight the infection. Let's see where all that goes. That's churning faster, so therefore your baby blood cells are going to be greater in number. And that includes the red blood cells. So that's where that comes from. When you explain it things simplistically like that, which is how I like to talk to my patients, they understand and are way more compliant and appreciative of you kind of helping them to understand why these answers are. Serum calcitonin, what's that? Not specifically what's that value, but what relevance is calcitonin? Takes the Say that louder. It takes the calcium deposit of the bone. So it takes the calcium away from deposited in the bone? Is that what you're saying? Why don't put it in the bone? Deposit putting it in the bone. Calcitonin. Have you guys learned that that's one of the biggest markers to tell with adult sepsis? No. No? I know that Dr. McNeil taught that before I got to this lecture last year, but I didn't know where it, it existed. It may have been something that he mentioned to you guys. It may not have been, but you know, just like anybody else that gives you tons of knowledgeable information, sometimes that big red flag doesn't highlight to you. But know that, and you'll learn that more in ER. Okay? Not so much for peds, adults. We're going to use the serum calcitonin to help to know the severity and the progression along with the CRP. Okay. Lights. What's that indicating? I'm sorry, I used obviously um, a lot of jargon that you may not know, but you should. What is it? Electrolytes. Oh, electrolytes. Okay, good. Electrolytes and LFTs. What are LFTs? Function tests. And why are those again important? So liver functions to do hepatitis, any inflammation of the liver. Hepatitis doesn't mean it's viral, A, B, C, D, or E, or F, or however down the alphabet we're in. Uh, but also any inflammation of the liver itself. You can have hepatitis that's not a viral number or letter. You can have just inflammation of the liver, whether it's secondary to cholangitis or cholelithiasis or just hepatitis alone that we don't know what the etiology is yet. Electrolytes, what's that going to help you to analyze that has to do with fever of unknown origin? Yeah. Hydration, extremely important and also high or low, especially with one electrolyte that's going to cause, well, actually there's a few electrolytes, but the one that's going to cause arrhythmia is the fastest, potassium. What are the other two that we would be worried about? Calcium and magnesium, right. And why magnesium? It does, but magnesium, uh, depending on the level, if it is off, you cannot correct calcium and potassium without your magnesium being corrected, nor sodium. Okay? So if you've got a hypovolemic patient, they're extremely dry, and they've got a fever, they're causing themselves to even be more dehydrated. That is the importance of your treatment as well. Um, the other thing is, is with pneumonia, so we've got an elevated white count, they've got all the symptoms of the pneumonia, but their chest x-ray is clear, give them water, poof, their chest x-ray fluffs up and shows you that infiltrate. It's magic. It's almost like a, those magic things that the kids do, those markers, can not show up unless you use those markers, so sometimes the pneumonia won't show up until you water it. Keep that in mind. <laughs> that will help you in the ER. All right. Uh, blood culture and sensitivity. That's what the CNS stands for. Obviously, we're going to be looking for ideology there within the blood, whether it's a vasculitis or just a heme uh, kinetic uh, infection. And that includes leukemias or lymphomas. Obviously, the blood culture and sensitivity will not be positive if that is uh, a lymphoma. 
but it'll be negative, so it's going to help you to rule that out. Culture insensitivity, again, doesn't mean just bacterial. So make sure you're anaerobic, aerobic bacteria, viral. Fungus. Fungal. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. So three big ones. And make sure on your bacteria that's always aerobic and anaerobic. Urine culture and sensitivity. And then the UDS, so urine dipstick. LP stands for lumbar puncture. lumbar puncture. Obviously, you're analyzing the cerebral spinal fluid during the culture and sensitivity as well. You will get this in more detail in ER, so you're not uh, having to know all of this now. Um, but again, the CSF as well is going to be bacterial, fungal, viral. Acid fast bacilli. That one has to be listed separately, even though it's uh, because it's not really anaerobic or aerobic, but it's going to give you definitively more. It's just the way that it is stained um, more so. Acid fast. And we've already talked about the chest x ray, so we're going to rule out pneumonia, we're going to rule out TB, we're going to rule out fungal neoplasms, so on. Abdominal ultrasound, so if all of those are pointing as far as your physical exam to your abdomen, but we don't have a recent surgery, would be a number one easy way to identify, um, or something that's been treated recently and just gotten worse, uh, do an abdominal ultrasound. If you're in the ER, you can do a fast um, ultrasound, which is essentially just a, a scanning for the most typical causes. And you'll learn that in All right. The rest of your investigation of fever of unknown origin depends on what your findings are. So if you've got LFTs that are extremely elevated, then you're going to also do a hepatic profile, which then specifically tells you, do we have a viral hepatitis, A, B, C, D, blah, 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 or do we just have a generic hepatitis that we've got to look at otherwise? Do I have a patient that is an alcoholic? Do I have a patient that uh, overdosed on Tylenol when they were a teenager? Think of those things. They're not going to just come right out and tell you that right off the bat. Those are the things when you're thinking liver, what are the possibilities that it can be causing this? Um, or even recent. Did you take a whole bottle of Tylenol before you came in here? Um, and then liver biopsy, obviously. If your LFTs were elevated and they answered uh, to where you still don't have a real avenue to go down according to your history of asking questions, do the liver biopsy. Obviously, that's going to be more invasive, so you're going to be asking a lot of those questions. And you're also going to be asking contraindications uh, things that would put them at higher risk if you did that liver biopsy. You'll have all of that knowledge because you'll be specialized or sending them to interventional radiology and they'll do that question. Okay. Bone marrow biopsy, so when would you need that examination? What are we looking at? <laughs> Say it louder, one person there. <laughs> so, erythropoiesis, whether it's a lymphoma or a leukemia. Um, and then we've already talked about the temporal artery biopsy. CT of the chest and abdomen. So if our ultrasound is in, not indicative and it says undifferentiated, which most of the time the radiologist is going to say, this looks suggestive of da da da, recommend CT or MRI with or without contrast. Do what is recommended because you're never going to be 100% because nothing in medicine is 100%, right? So, if it is recommended, do it. Otherwise, if something bad goes wrong, you are going to be liable. And the indication that is recommended by another specialist is going to be covered by insurance and you're covered for ordering that test. So again, no. If they're saying recommended this, no why. If you don't know why, call a radiologist. Again, they are our colleagues. Why is it? What do you think is going on here? You know, it's okay for you not to know. You're not going to know everything ever. There's still tons of stuff that I don't know. 
don't be embarrassed to ask. Communicate. What do you think is going on? Because they're going to respect you and talk to you more on the phone in the future and knowing what you know as you're building as well as your curiosity and your persistence shows your dedication to your patients. And if that's not commendable, I don't know what it is. So, CT, abdomen or chest, knowing uh, what you're looking for. Write it down on the order sheet, whether or not you need contrast, with or without contrast. Where specifically are you ordering a CT? You can't just write CT. You have to say, CT neck. CT neck for thyroid or CT neck for C-spine. What are we looking at? Or CT neck for soft tissues because we're figure something when you're going on with the airway or you've got an obstruction or a foreign body. CT of the chest, and that's pulmonary, heart, any of those, perivascular areas. CT of the spine, differentiate which part of the spine, C-spine, T-spine, L-spine. CT of the abdomen, CT of the abdomen because I'm looking for what? It's okay for you not to know whether or not it's contrast or not. I took me forever to figure out when do I order it with and without contrast. You're going to have a lot of stuff thrown at you in ER. Um, knowing what you're looking for will tell you whether or not you need contrast. And if you need contrast, what kind of contrast do I need to help light up what it is that I'm looking for? But putting in the notes to the radiologist, I'm doing this to rule out. The reason we do that is to communicate what is the most probable, highest thing on your differential that you definitely need ruled out or in. And then they will also call back and go, well, really it would be better to do this test. And it's amazing because you're like, thank you. I didn't want to waste money on doing a test that wasn't needed. Or if you've got a better test that I didn't know about, they're going to communicate that. That's why it's really important for you to put in. It's not the fact that the ICD-10 allows you to code for a rule out, because that's not the case. Used to be. Used to be you could admit somebody to the floor to rule out the acute appendicitis. You cannot do that anymore. You cannot diagnose, look up ICD-10 and try to rule out for anything, and it's not going to happen. But you're writing that on there, communicating with the radiologist. Extremely important. All right. The rest of them, your gallium scans. So this is a scintography, which is a um, nuclear medicine test. This is using gamma scan. It's not a PET scan. Totally different. And then, again, this tells you you use contrast for infection, inflammation, or tumors. Uh, it is a nuclear tracer that is put into their vein that goes to whatever organ or whatever site that you are suspicious of and will show a hot or cold spot. Okay? Now, again, it doesn't tell you whether or not that's infection or inflammation because both are going to light up similarly. But depending on your history and again, what all is going on is going to help you differentiate that. So as far as the amount of radiation given with a gamma scan, and again with that nuclear medicine scan, you're going to specify what it is that you're looking for. So we had a patient in Good Shepherd just a couple of weeks ago that had a parathyroid nodule. Um, so she had had an ultrasound because we knew her thyroid was enlarged. We knew her uh, thyroid, TSH was normal, T3, T4 was fine, but her PTH was high. When off the charts high, so then uh, the ultrasound showed, yes, she's got an enlargement. We did a CT to further differentiate that, and then it showed that it's off of the parathyroid. Now, you can't do a fine needle aspiration of the parathyroid with an ultrasound guide, and it's impossible. It's hard enough to do a thyroid nodule, let alone a parathyroid, because it's within that, right? You're not going to just slice her open just so you can get a biopsy. So then you go to a nuclear medicine scan, and you literally we ordered a nuclear medicine scan of the neck and literally put in parathyroid nodule where it was and obviously sent the report uh, from the radiologist from the previous test. So communication, key. The radiation of a gamma scan is less than an x-ray or a CT, which is because it's 
finally just focused right in there. Now again, this is again a scan, not the gamma rays used for radiation for cancer or chemotherapy. And, that. and then your PET scan obviously is similar to a CAT scan. So when you do a body scan, do a gamma body scan first before you do a PET scan of the whole body because then you're thinking all that radiation through the whole body times what a CT of one area is. So a gamma scan has less radiation than a PET scan. GI endoscopy, obviously, to do a biopsy if we're thinking that it was uh, derived within the GI tract. And then again, you've got your echocardiogram, or your echoes. Um, you've got the echocardiogram with the gamma scan. Um, we had a, yeah, it was uh, Matt Burris that talked to you guys about that in cardiology way back in the day. So when you have a nuclear medicine study of the heart to help you to see the functionality of each chamber of the heart and it lit up differently, it's not something you need to memorize or know, just know that that's a test for you to figure out. So the echocardiogram um, is just, the main thing is to look at the ultrasound, look at the valvular function, the function of each chamber wall, the thickness, those measurements, but then there's also a thallium scan, thallium gadolinium, technetium, all those fancy words in radiology, they'll know which one to use, depending on, again, what you're looking for. Um, and that helps them to rate the severity of their congestive heart failure or um, the functionality of, of that. Transesophageal echocardiogram has to be literally, specifically ordered in that manner if that's what you want done. That is one that you're looking through the esophagus at the posterior wall of the heart. Um, they do that so uh, as to rule out any possible thrombus that were being uh, developed in atrial fib before you convert them so that you're not causing a stroke when you convert them back to normal full-fledged ejection fraction. So before they did the ablation on my mom, they did a transesophageal echocardiogram. Right after she was put to sleep, they did that before they proceeded with the ablation so that they could look at the right atrium in full, making sure there's no hidden clots being developed. All right. Most common etiology uh, of sepsis, again, because they wanted me to specifically go over urosepsis. So infectious-wise, in adults, pneumonia number one, abdominal infection is going to be number two. Kidney infection, regardless if that's pyelonephritis or then just down into UTI and sepsis. And then your bacteremia, which is your vasculitis. UTI, this is stuff that you learned in GU. So real quickly, obviously, um, it is regardless if it's on a, a male within the urethra um, or can be a female, just less commonly, sorry, urethra is really short. Cystitis being in the bladder and then pyelonephritis being in the kidneys themselves. Bacteria is in the presence of symptoms. Bacteria is noted on the um, urinalysis. We know that women more than men, age difference, of course, uh, old and young, more probable and more sick with symptoms. Your urethritis and cystitis are the lower, and then the upper is your bladder and the kidney. Symptoms, dysuria, frequency, uh, gross hematuria, which is gross, just means that you can visibly see it not on a microscope. Fever and CPA tenderness, they don't have to have all of these, just some of them. Um, pyelonephritis um, almost always will have the CBA tenderness, but again, not 100%. Nothing in medicine is 100. Uh, the flank pain is associated with fever, uh, and then sometimes they will have nausea and vomiting with that too. What's prostration mean? 
Alright, and then pyelonephritis, you're going to use Cipro or amoxicillin clavulonic acid, which is augmentin. At a high enough dose for a long enough period of time to penetrate. I'm in with men, again, most commonly it's from an STI, STD, Rocephin, and Zithromax. Make sure you ask them because when you give them PO Zithromax that high of a dose, they, uh, they are easily made nauseated and throw up, they'll throw it up and then it won't work. Mm -hmm. So make sure you ask that because then I also will give them so friend and tell them to take it 40 minutes before they do this treatment. So if they throw it up, it doesn't work. And then you've got somebody still inventing everybody out there. So think of two steps ahead of yourself of what the possibilities are. Alright. Sepsis, urosepsis. So again. The de definition of neurosepsis typically presents with fever, chills, lethargy, altered mental status, especially with a, an elderly patient. could just be an altered mental status. Or they could just say, I don't feel right. Yay. Yeah. love that. Check their urine. could be something as simple as that. Not always going to have CBA tenderness or supercubic tenderness, okay? Uh, and then again, obviously, if they do have complaints of dysuria, flank pain, fever, those kinds of things, then that helps you that much more. Sepsis. So mm -hmm. sepsis is defined as a suspected or proven infection <coughs> with the presence of the surge criteria. Again, you're going to learn this in ER. You don't need to know this for today. Just know that some people are like, well, I don't know the difference between UTI and urosepsis. Well, you're going to know what the criteria for sepsis are, and then you're going to know how to differentiate that. Because obviously, if you've got somebody that's eurosepsis versus just a UTI, you're going to be more aggressive. They're going to be in, um, hospitalized. Sometimes it's going to be hospitalized just to the floor. Sometimes it's going to go straight to the ICU. It depends on their status. Not only of their altered mental status, because if they've got Alzheimer's, that doesn't really mean a whole lot. But if they're hypotensive, that's the number one thing with sepsis. Hypotension is going to be huge, and you'll learn that Dr. Lovelace will scare the shit out of you. Because when he gave that lecture a couple of years ago, I went, oh, I don't know if I want to do ER anymore. <laughs> no, it's becoming a new thing for attorneys to pick on. Mm -hmm. So he's going to teach you how not to uh, miss it. Hypotension is going to be huge. Take anything away from anesthesis. Hypotension is going to be a big one. And that doesn't have to be a large amount of hypotension to where you're just 60 over pal. Just lower than what they normally are. Hypoxemia, obviously, oliguria, um, metabolic acidosis, those things that we know is severe. <coughs> but uh, severe sepsis, there's also uh, not just an infection going on, but you've got an organ that's been targeted and it's starting to shut down. That's the difference between just regular sepsis and severe sepsis. So severe urosepsis, you're not just going to have a little bit of elevation of BUN creatinine. You're going to have either a lack of urine output or a very, very slim amount, mictrition or microurination. Um, you're going to have uh, BUN and creatinine severely elevated in your um, liver function. Or, I'm sorry, your kidney function is going to look like you're in kidney belly. Mm -hmm. And that can be turned around. And again, some of those things can cause a, a urosepsis. So uh, their blood sugars being way out of whack and then being in DKA, they could also have a urinary tract infection because diabetics most often do. Again, bacteria love sugar and they're spilling a crap load of sugar into their urine. And so you're feeding the bacteria and there they start with pyelonephritis and it's gotten into their bloodstream. And now you've got DKA and urosepsis. Yay. So, treating the, the underlying um, ideology of what's causing that, not only the infection but the DKA, you're going to have to do both for them to get better. So, again, sometimes when you've got the answer, it doesn't mean you've got the complete answer, so don't eliminate everything. Make sure that you're looking at all the tests that you're ordering. That's something, you know, as being a student, um, we didn't really pound into your head. When you order something at Good Shepherd, 
you better be looking at your file, even after you finished your note, for those results. Because you're responsible for following up on those results. And if they're abnormal and you don't act upon it, then who is? We've got your back, we're beside you, but you guys need to start paying attention to that. And I'm going to start holding you accountable, not meaning I'm going to let somebody suffer or have a problem. But over your last visits at Good Shepherd, if you're going to be going through before December 5th, I'm going to expect you guys to be following those up and communicating. And if you can't get a hold of your faculty provider, then communicate with me. Okay? All right. Estimated one quarter of sepsises are called sepsis, sepsis, sepsis. A sepsis is caused by urogenital infections. Just very common. All right. We've already talked about that. Treatment, again, treatment would be hospitalizing them and then treating the underlying etiology to get them better. Volume, volume, volume is going to be very important. Just because they're not putting out any urine uh, doesn't mean that you don't water them. Um, you've got medications and being able to help um, that work better. All right. You guys take